Great. Well, it's a great pleasure today to welcome Professor Martin Rudwick. Particularly great pleasure because um, I'm, I'm Bob White, I'm Associate Director of the Faraday, but uh, by profession my day job is a geologist. And Martin actually started in the same department as I'm in a little while before I got there. Uh, was a, an undergraduate, a PhD student and a lecturer there. Uh, before he then joined the, the very new then Department of History and Philosophy of Science in Cambridge. He moved on after that to uh, the Free University. I don't know whether this is the right order, but he was certainly in the Free University, Princeton and uh, University of California, before he returned to the delights of Ely, where he now lives. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have Martin talking about um, the apparent conflict that there has been between geology and genesis, and how this is really just a myth. So I hope he's going to demythologize it for us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be able to address this distinguished audience. Um, yes, I was trained as a geologist and then reinvented myself as a historian, much to, to the dismay of the scientists who were then my colleagues. I think things got better since then. Um, and but uh, because I sort of switched horses in mid-career, I um, capitalized on my hands-on experience of the earth sciences by specializing ever since in the, uh, in my research at least, in, in, in the history of the earth sciences. And in that context, of course, I immediately came up against this uh, story that uh, the history of geology has been disastrously uh, hampered, held back, opposed, etc., by those who were um, standing up for the, the, the truth of Genesis. Now, I call this, this is, this is pretty, pretty um, well-known stuff, uh, that there was this supposed conflict between geology and Genesis, not only at the present day, and one of my colleagues posted uh, to, to me by email earlier this week something I hadn't seen in The Guardian, which was a, uh, an item about the imminent opening of the world's first creation science museum near Cincinnati, I think, uh, in Kentucky, which is not exactly an enlightened state. Uh, <laughs> and that is a reminder that in America, though thankfully not in the same degree in Europe, in which, in, which, in which term, by the way, I include our own offshore island, um, we are up, still up against this kind of problem, which the modern scientists, earth scientists in America have a lot of trouble with. Anyway, it's well known that there was, there's a supposed conflict historically. Uh, and over the years, <coughs> while I've been doing my historical research on the early history of geology, which has been really to, to, to try and understand the, how the, what, what geologists now take absolutely for granted how this first came to be uh, worked out. Uh, while I've been doing that research, um, again and again, almost like clockwork as it were, when, my, uh, when my, I explained to my friends and colleagues what I was trying to do, that I was trying to understand the history of the sort of dawning awareness of uh, that, that the whole of human history was a tiny sliver of time at the tail end of an immensely long uh, and eventful uh, history of the earth, or geohistory as geologists often call it, uh, the reaction would almost always be, oh well then, I suppose you have to deal with the conflict between geology and Genesis, or between geologists and the church, with a capital C, or most of this, most, or, most of all, between science, with a capital S, and religion, with a capital R. Well, actually not, because what I've tried to do is to be as good a historian as I can be, and by following the historical actors themselves, uh, I came to realize that this is largely a myth, uh, that the, the, the so-called core conflict was uh, very, very specific in the way I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Anyway, the, the, the conflict is assumed to be central by the general public, and of course this is a, a myth which is sedulously fostered by those self 
appointed spokespersons for science with a capital S, who I think are legitimately, we can legitimately describe as atheistic fundamentalists. I don't need to suggest who I have in mind <laughs> uh, for that label. Um, and yet, it's a myth in both senses of the word. It's a myth in the everyday colloquial sense that it's largely untrue. But it's also, more importantly, a myth in the more important, in, in, the, in the true and technical sense of the word, in that it is a story which is doing <coughs> work for certain people, uh, ideological work. Um, and that's very obvious, I think, in the, in the present world. And the myth, it's a myth, the myth of conflict with Galileo and Darwin as stereotypes and this geology and genesis business is another one, um, has a great deal of power in the public sphere, and I think we should be aware of that. So I want to try to demythologize or deconstruct this uh, story of perennial and intrinsic conflict. And what it simply needs is some really decent work in the history of, of the relevant science and the history of, uh, of, of, of religion in the same period. And I say that because the great so often um, the, work, the uh, story of conflict is based on very bad history, uh, usually dressed up in popular form. And the main point I want to get across in, in this respect is very simply that you cannot understand this myth or understand why it needs demythologizing unless you recognize that the socio-political context in which the relevant debates happened, are all important. And for example, Andrew Dixon White, the author of a very well-known uh, late 19th century uh, book, which popular, first popularized the, the, uh, the, the metaphor of the warfare between science and religion, cannot be understood without taking into account the political situation that he was in as the president of, first president of Cornell, trying to stake out a place for higher education in the US, which would not be under the thumb of a particular denomination. Anyway, so I would say that the most important thing in understanding uh, this, this bit of history is that one has got to have some empathy with the people concerned, uh, and this is one of the one of the problems in that although I think by and large professional historians are taught and trained how to have this empathy with people who believed in magic and alchemy and astrology and all that sort of thing, and they do a very good job and try to get inside the mental world of people in earlier periods and understand even if even if what they believed in uh, is 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 what our modern age has has has. Uh, as abandoned, you have still got to understand it from the inside. And this is one of the problems, I think, with the history of the whole area of science and religion, in that there is so much hostility and sheer ignorance, particularly among modern intellectuals, to, towards anything religious. It's amazing ignorance, which these people would simply wouldn't put up with if it was some other uh, part of the past uh, world of knowledge. And the other thing is that We've got to be as alert to the diversity of the personnel involved, the people involved, the historical period, the geographical place, and the different kinds of science. We've always got to ask who thought there was a conflict, who experienced a conflict, when, what period, where, what country or part of the world, and what. Uh, in other words, in relation to what kind of science. And here I think the whole thing has been really, the waters have been muddied by what I like to call the Anglophone heresy of believing in a thing called science with a capital S. Whereas in reality, and I think most people who, who even scientists who, who, who stop to think about this rather than propagating an ideology, uh, realize that there is an enormous d diversity of the sciences, and what's true of one science may not be true of another science altogether at all. Now, I want to go move quickly from these generalities to my specific topic, and want to start with the the <coughs> issue which always comes up first and, has, and is put into 
greatest prominence, and that is the question of the age of the Earth. We can see this in relation to modern American creationism, which uh, champions the, the idea of what they call a young Earth, what, what I call historically a short time scale. Um, when I was teaching in San Diego, in California, just up the road, a few miles away, was a creationist museum, a very small one compared to the one that's now in the process of being developed. Um, and it was just amazing to see how they uh, devised a, a short, a, a young earth <coughs> interpretation of things like the, the Grand Canyon. Just staggering because they were, in effect, reinventing an artificial wheel in the sense that their arguments were replaying things that were arguments that were played out at a scholarly level three centuries ago in the, in the, in the 17th century. And so I will go plunge straight into the 17th century and I need the first s slide if we can um, get those, that curtain pulled back. I'm sorry, I'm you're having to it's on the motor, we have to press the button. You're having to enter re-enter the Stone Age, I'm afraid, because I am, am still living in the era BP before PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have simply I've been too busy doing my own research to find time to, to learn how to do this. So this is an old-fashioned slide. And some of you may not have seen the original uh, text in which the much maligned Archbishop Usher in the, 18, in the 17, uh, 1650s, in the 17th century, um, actually proposed this date of 4004 BC, which you see in the right-hand column, which is the, the year before Christ. And you see it's not the only chronology that he's dealing with. He's dealing with another thing called the Julian period, which I won't bother with. Um, and th this is the context in which he uh, claims that uh, to, to have calculated the precise moment of, of, of the creation as the beginning of time, interestingly enough. I like to tease my friends who are um, cosmologists and astrophysics by saying that you know, their talk about the Big Bang is remarkably similar in many ways to what Archbishop Usher was putting forward. Now the main point about bringing this up on is just to, to emphasize what some of you will know very well that Usher was just a not very distinguished member of a, a practitioner of a whole science which was called chronology, which was a, a science of textual scholarship, uh, not, not primary, not even primarily biblical. The biblical chronology came into it because it was one of the, it was thought to be one of the oldest uh, continuous records of uh, historical events. But mainly it was a historical science, it was a branch of human history. And the goal of it was to construct a, a, a world history which would um, uh, be, as it were, cross-cultural. And I put in, next slide, I put in, uh, some years ago I made a little histogram of Hush, based on Usher's great volume, which is almost as big as this great doorstop of a volume that of my own that I brought in um, as my little sales pitch. Um, but th this histogram shows the pages per century which Usher uh, gave, and I've put a time scale in a, being a, uh, once a geologist, always a geologist, the time scale, <coughs> time goes upwards, and you have creation at the bottom, and you have the birth of Christ at 4004 BC, and Usher ends his um, uh, narrative of AD 73, at the, just after the uh, fall of Jerusalem. Um, and what you notice there is that the, the vast majority of his book, the scholarship, the detailed, learned scholarship, uh, is 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 um, focused on the last few centuries because that's where most of the most of the evidence was. And there's practically nothing he skips from very, very quickly from creation right up to around the Exodus. So that just shows the, the, the public uh, uh, misapprehension of what on earth um, uh, but, uh, sorry, uh, Usher thought he was up to. And the other uh, thing which is very often 
misunderstood about this. This is the, I'm talking about about the 17th century, really, the early modern period, 16th, 17th century. The other thing, uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the frontispiece from another very famous work, somewhat later than Russia, another generation or two after Russia. Uh, this is uh, uh, Burnett's Sacred Theory of the Earth. And the frontispiece in those days served very much like a, pub, like a dust jacket in a publisher's blurb on a, on a modern book. In other words, a visual summary of the book. Uh, and here, this is, some of you may know this very well, but here we have uh, Christ, <coughs> I am Alpha and Omega, standing astride seven successive uh, phases in the history of the Earth, with <coughs> the present in, right in the middle, and the flood in the, in the past, and the supposed conflagration which you get in, in, in Peter's first letter uh, in, the, in the future. Now the point about that is that it's a, although it's arranged in a circle, it is a, in fact a linear kind of history, and it has a, a sort of uh, a cosmic uh, environment of, of angels, but above all it has the figure of Christ in charge of the whole thing from beginning to end, a standard well-known uh, biblical motif. But the point I want to make is if you look at uh, Burnett's book, the, the position that he's arguing against is not what we might expect from a sort of you know, a modern standpoint of a very long time scale. He's, he's suggesting a very short time scale, of course, because it's standard for his period. There was no very good reason to suppose otherwise. But the, reason, the, the, the position that he is opposed to, as I say, not a sort of modern time scale of millions of years or a few billions, but Aristotle's concept of eternalism. It's a concept of an uncreated eternal cosmos, is what somebody like Burnett and lots of his contemporaries were uh, campaigning against. So at that period, in the 17th century, the conflict, as far as there was a, there was a conflict, was not, it was between two alternatives, neither of which was the modern concept of a very long but finite history of the Earth. The conflict was, was between the, the standard orthodox and consensual picture of a short and finite history, and on the other hand, the concept, the Aristotelian concept, of, a, an, of an infinitely long and therefore uncreated uh, kind of history where everything just, where it wasn't in fact a history because it just went on and on. Now my torch is <coughs> given out. Another bit of low technology to do without that. Um, so the modernity it consisted in extent it didn't, was was not what what happened in the in the development of, of modernity in this in about the age of the earth was to extend the short time scale, um, but specifically to 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 recognise that a great deal of the history of the earth was prehistorical and, and even pre-human. That is the real novelty, and. By the time you get to the 18th century, the relevant savants, and I like to call them savants rather than scientists, because scientists has all the wrong anachronistic connotations, the relevant savants who worked on what they called natural history became aware that there was good evidence for an immensely long time scale, although they couldn't put any figures to it. But it doesn't actually matter that you couldn't put any figures to it. In, in geology, we, we weren't able to put any, any decent figures, really, until after the discovery of radioactivity at the very end of the 19th century, the first, first years of the 20th century. It didn't matter. You could do very good geology, and, and on the assumption that, that you, uh, not the assumption, that with the evidence of an immensely long time scale, without having to be able to put figures to it. So that's what was already the case in the 18th century. Next slide, please. And the reason that, that that was widely thought isn't, um, were, I think, two in particular. One was, this is, this is just a view in the, in the French Alps, but it could be anywhere, really. Um, you could, the, the, the Canadian Rockies showed this very clearly, where you can actually see immense piles of sedimentary strata 
thousands of feet thick, or high in this case. Uh, when you look at them close up, you see that they're, uh, many of them are made of, of layers of rock, often containing obvious marine shells, uh, which have obviously lived on the spot. Some of them are sort of, you can see that they've obviously lived on the spot, they haven't been thrown together in confusion at all. Um, and the implication was pretty clear that these represent a very, very long time scale. Next slide shows uh, a, an 18th century manuscript uh, <coughs> slice or section through the edge of the Italian Alps, uh, sh sh distinguishing one formation of strata after another. And the scale of this, one of the ones in the middle, marked N actually, is also labelled as being 3,000 feet thick. So it's an immense thickness of strata, and it became absolutely inconceivable that all this could represent, could, could be compressed into a short time scale. Of course, it isn't totally inconceivable because some people do still conceive it, and that's what these American uh, fundamentalists are, are do, curr currently do with, for example, they with the, with the Grand Canyon. They say that they, these thousands of feet of, of sediments have all been deposited in a few, in a, in a few years. Um, at the other, th 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 this thick, thick um, lot of strata was one reason why uh, it was the general view, even in the 18th century, that the time scale must be immensely long. The other one was to do with, with volcanoes. Next slide, please. It actually shows a, one of pictures of, from uh, Sir William Hamilton's famous book on, the, on, on, on Vesuvius, showing one of the eruptions of Vesuvius. And the, the point is that there were historical records of one eruption after another. Next slide shows the even greater, the largest uh, volcano in, in, in Europe, namely Etna. And this is a, this is a, a, a late 18th century uh, sketch showing all these uh, volcanic cones, some of them with lava flows, the dark stuff coming out of them, and many of them dated from historical records. And one could get a very good idea, because the records have been so well kept on it and over, uh, ever since antiquity, you get a very good idea of how much of this enormous 10,000 foot cone with all these little, little sort of subsidiary volcanoes on the flanks, uh, how much of this had been accumulated uh, within historical uh, with a period of historical records, the last two and, a, two and a half thousand years or so. And it was very clearly a very, very small fraction of the whole. This was a very striking uh, piece of evidence at the time that the, this volcano, yeah, the whole volcano, must stretch, its, its history must stretch back far before, far long before uh, any recorded history. So by the end of the 18th century, there was a very strong qualitative sense of what geologists now sometimes call deep time to match the cosmologist's deep space. Uh, and it is not important that it was unquantified. The quantification came much later. And this sense of the immensely long history of the Earth was only strengthened in the, was, was, was still further strengthened, I should say, in the early 19th century. Now, uh, the, how, how, how was all this related to, to uh, views about the, uh, the meaning of, the, of Genesis and the rest of the Bible? Well, I think the important point here is to make is that by the late 18th century, among savants, or what we were including the people we would now call scientists, this was simply unimportant, whether they were religious or not, because there was a long-standing hermeneutic tradition going right back to the patristic era, uh, according to which, well, if you like, like to try and make a match what was being found scientifically with, what, with, the, with the narrative in Genesis 1, well, you could say, well, it looks as though the days of the Genesis account correspond to immensely long periods of, of, of time in the, in, in the history of the Earth. Or you could say, alternatively, that... Um, that, that, that Genesis 1 was simply a story about, about human history. There were various ways to, to, to deal with it, and it was just became a pretty marginal issue. Also, I think far more importantly, the literalism which 
was had been pretty much a novelty, a little bit literalistic interpretation, had been novelty in the 17th century. By the late 18th, in the what's often called the Romantic period, were beginning to uh, yield to a, to a re renewed sense of the multivocality of, of, of biblical language, and particularly to the sense that the, the meaning of the biblical uh, narratives might be actually um, obscured by this excessive interest in exactly what this might have meant um, scientifically. The example, the little metaphor, the little episode, sorry, anecdote that I'd like to, to, to use in this context is if you think of Haydn's great oratorio, Die Schöpfung, the, the, the creation, which was um, first performed in, the, in, in Vienna in the uh, 1790s, uh, to <coughs> rapturous applause by the, the, the music going uh, public, the Viennese public, um, with uh, which is you, some of you will know, and some of you may have even have sung in it as I have, wonderful, it worked, um, which is based on Genesis one. Haydn had been of uh, when he was living in London a few years earlier, had been an acquaintance of, or even of, I think probably a friend of a naturalist called John Hunter, who was certainly well aware of, an, of, of the immense time scale of the Earth. I think it's very likely that Haydn was well aware of this, but my argument is that it was completely irrelevant to Haydn. Haydn was a very devout Catholic Christian, and said, said at the time that he put, he put his religious life into, into the composition of Schöpfung as much as in, into any of his compositions. But it seems to me that there's no reason to imagine that he would have thought it was of any interest or imp not of any religious importance. It might be a scientifically fascinating subject, but not of any religious importance to, to say, well, you know, when did all this occur? How many thousands of years ago? Just not important. So that's in the late 18th century. And it's only in the 1820s, well into the 19th century, and more specifically, only in this strange benighted country of ours here, that there was a reversion to literalism in the movement that was often called by its adherents scriptural geology, which was entirely outside the circles of savants or of scientists, and specifically of geologists, including, and, and it was attacked most vehemently by those geologists, and they called themselves geologists by the 1820s, by those geologists who were believing Christians. It was, in other words, it was a conflict which was played out on a, on a, a dimension of uh, social groups. And <coughs> this, con so this conflict with, between so-called scriptural <coughs> geology and what the people who call themselves scientific geologists, uh, including those who are religious, uh, was an early pro, um, predecessor of the modern uh, conflict that, they, that, that, that earth scientists in America have with, uh, with the creationists. So much for the creation story. Now quickly, moving on to, I want to um, say a little bit about the, the story of the flood. So we move on from the first chapter of Genesis to the sixth to eighth chapters. Um, and the important point here, I think, is to say that at the time, and I'm now talking, going to be talking about, about the early 19th century, um, at that time, the flood story was seen to be historical in character in a way which, which was no longer um, uh, uh, applied to the creation story. And this is because it appeared to, to be based on some kind of, at least the, in, 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 in Genesis, you could trace back uh, a, a, a line of, of historical narrative back to Noah's flood. And more importantly, similar stories were being discovered in non-European cultures. And, uh, even as far away as China. So it appeared to be a, an intercultural phenomenon. Uh, and 
it did look as though, well, whether you believe that the, the stories were accurate or legendary or garbled in one way or another, or purely mythical in the, in the technical sense, um, nevertheless, it, 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 the, 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 the event was historical in character. It was part of the Earth's history and part of human history. And specifically, it was, uh, seemed to be a sort of boundary event between human history and this now extremely long pre-human history in which the record of the rocks and the volcanoes and so on was, was turning up. And it was a boundary event because the evidence for it seemed to be you come uniquely both from human history and from natural records. And the general attitude to this was that these were complementary, not conflicting sources of evidence. Uh, there were natural documents as well as human documents that, f that fed into this. So, in the early 19th century, there was a very important scientific theory, which was usually called diluvial, uh, derived from the word the deluge, of course, which was often uh, described as, as uh, dealing with an apparent event in the past, which was often called the, the geological deluge. And it was a separate question whether the ge geological deluge was the same event as Noah's flood. They, people were not always consistent in using deluge for one and flood for the other, but, but I find for analytically it's a helpful distinction to make because they were recognizing that they were distinct things. And the diluvial theory, because of its supposed equation with uh, the biblical flood has been uh, sneered at consistently by historians, with a few honorable exceptions, for I don't know how long. But when you look at the historical records and you try to think yourself back into the, into the uh, world of these people, and the, these geologists in the early, early 19th century, you realize that this is a very serious scientific theory dealing with a very serious scientific problem. Next slide, please. The biggest, uh, the most important uh, example of the kind of problem it is, is this kind of thing. This is a very famous block of granite. Uh, you see the scale from the little hammer-wielding geologist at the foot of it. This is a manuscript sketch, uh, which is stuck several hundred feet above the, the city of Neuchâtel and its lake uh, at, the f at the far side of the Swiss plain from the high Alps. And the kind of difference, geologists, any geologists here will uh, know that granites can quite easily be recognized, specific granites, because they're all slightly different and they're it's rather like, uh, uh, you know, different kinds of handwriting or something like that. Uh, it's pretty easy to, to find out where this granite has originated because it's sitting on, uh, on, on a limestone base at the base of the Jura Hills. And it, it could be traced back, it was traced back in the very early 19th century to its source in the High Alps about 100 kilometers away. It has somehow moved 100 kilometers up over uh, a Next slide, uh, we'll show, oh no, next, next slide is, that's, uh, that's my picture of it. It's now rather overgrown with in, in the middle of the forest, but and it's got a, a commemorative plaque on it because it's historically so important. But it, uh, it's, I, I took this photograph while I was on my, it happened to be on my own, so I couldn't put a, a figure in to, to show the scale. But it is, it is as large as a, as a decent sized cottage. It's moved 100 kilometers or 60 miles, roughly, uh, up and down over hills. The next slide shows a early 19th century uh, map of, of it, which I wish I had a, my pointer. But anyway, the, the, this is in the High Alps here. The granite had its uh, origin there. It had clearly come all the way down the lower, uh, sorry, the upper Rhone Valley, across the head of the uh, Lake of Geneva, across the Swiss plain, which in fact, as you can see from the profile below, is, is not really a plain, it's, um, it's low hills. Uh, and the, that erratic block that I just showed you pictures of uh, ended up on the far side of that lake in the top left-hand corner. How on earth did it get there? The best <coughs> suggestion at the time 
was put forward by the, the Prussian geologist who, who made this map, uh, Leopold von Buch, uh, was that it was some kind of what we might now call a kind of turbidity current, uh, a sort of enormous mass of um, perhaps a very muddy water might have been able to sustain uh, these. And it's that, that erratic I showed you is, is just one of hundreds. It's an exceptionally large one, but there, there are hundreds or thousands of them. It's a huge phenomenon. And it seemed to need, on good Newtonian principles, it need, seemed to need an e equally huge uh, source, of, uh, a huge origin, huge causal origin. So, mm -hmm. next slide. Um, Here's another one from the 1840s, from a book in the 1840s, was discovered and was, was well known much earlier than that. Again, you can see the size of it. This is in the Upper Rhone Valley, but high above the valley floor. And that one is about uh, 30 kilometers, I think, from, from the source area of the, where the, that particular granite very clearly, uh, unambiguously, unquestionably came from. Next slide shows, I think, my... Uh, modern picture of it. It's now rather ingloriously in the in a hospital car park, but you can just see in the distance perhaps a sense that the, this is several hundred feet above the, the floor of the uh, Rhone Valley. How on earth did it get there? That is the diluvial theory trying to make a, a next slide, um, an explanation of it. Here is a, a very good uh, attempt at making an explanation of it. This is uh, uh, James Hall's uh, theory of how you might, how, what the origin of, of tsunamis might be. And you see, this is, this is five successive uh, um, snapshots, as it were. Let's notice the, the uh, town on the left, you see, in, in this last one, is being overwhelmed by a, 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 a tsunami, which... Uh, when I first began writing the uh, sequel to this volume, when I first began writing this volume, I felt I had to explain to an order to, a, to an audience of non-specialists, non-geologists, what on earth a tsunami was. Now everybody knows what a tsunami is. So the theory at the time was that these, that this the diluvial theory was that it might have been due to what I like to call a, a mega tsunami, something be beside which what happened around the Indian Ocean, whenever it was a couple of years ago, uh, would have been a very small-scale event. There was no reason to suppose that if you magnified the, the causal uh, uh, event of a, some kind of upheaval of the ocean floor, why you shouldn't have a very much larger uh, effect, effects being sort of proportional to causes, yeah, with a new Newtonian view. So, the next slide shows this same um, uh, Hall's uh, detailed map of the Corstorphine Hills just to the west of Edinburgh, uh, showing this very striking and um, bizarre topography which he attributed to uh, uh, to this um, uh, diluvial event, this, this geological deluge. And it was obvious starting point to interpret uh, this deluge as being equivalent to the, the, the only comparably big event that was recorded in early human history, named the, the Biblical Deluge. But as I say, it wasn't just the Biblical Deluge, it was also similar uh, events recorded in, or supposedly recorded, in the ancient literatures of various other non-European cultures. So, next slide. This was extended by the great uh, French naturalist Georges Cuvier uh, to, into an explanation of the, for the uh, apparently sudden extinction of the very large extinct mammal species, which he was a brilliant enough anatomist to be able to reconstruct from their bones, uh, this in modern terms, the Pleistocene megafauna. How had these things, this is a, um, uh, these are the, uh, some of the teeth of, of uh, uh, the extinct were, uh, uh, hippopotamus, which was wandering around Northwest Europe, not very apparently in the very recent geologically geologically recent past, but prehistoric, of course. And Cuvier, next slide, uh, not only reconstructed all these. Here's his mastodon. Um, not only reconstructed all these creatures, showed that they were distinct from any living species, so they were definitely extinct but suggested that this same diluvial event, or the same geological deluge, could have been responsible for wiping them out. 
And this is a very good and fertile scientific theory. And Cuvier, as I've already said, extended this just he didn't he, he absorbed the Genesis story into a whole series of multicultural flood stories uh, and certainly was not being literal about them because obviously the if you take the um, the story of Noah's flood it does not suggest anything like a mega tsunami so they were having to they were using the the, the Genesis account as a historical document that might well be pretty garbled account, but nevertheless have a core of historicity to it. So the next next slide, please. So this was then slightly uh, narrowed down by William Buckland, the first uh, professor of geology at Oxford. This is his picture of uh, his map of the Oxford region, in effect, showing with a stippling uh, the telltale erratic pebbles of a specific kind, which he could show had been swept from their origin right up in the Midlands in Warwickshire, through two gaps in the Cotswolds, down past Oxford and down through the Goring Gap, where the Thames goes past Reading and, and all the way to London. How had this happened? It obviously couldn't be attributed to the present river system at all. So this was a kind of evidence. And Buckland, because of the specific uh, uh, political situation in, in Oxford, made a great thing of this being, uh, the, the geological deluge being the very same event as Noah's flood. But he actually became more and more in a minority on that, on that point. Um, and uh, what, of course, what happened was that uh, the, the evidence for some kind of geological deluge became stronger and stronger. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so these scratch rocks were one of the, one of the very uh, most puzzling uh, features that uh, suggested that, the, that an area had been swept over by some huge, perhaps a huge turbidity current of some kind. Next one. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Uh, and this is, this is from uh, a large-scale map of uh, a point in, in, in central Sweden where the little tailed arrows you can see trending this way, paying no attention to the topography, uh, showed where the, the direction of the scratches, that something extraordinary had, had, had passed over this area. Next slide. Through. This is the same uh, Swedish geologist's map of the whole of the south of Sweden. Uh, we can see the ta small tailed arrows trending more or less southwards right across the whole country. What on earth had produced this? Next slide. As the years went by into the 1830s, this is just a, my uh, rough uh, draft of a map that will be published in a smarter form, showed the directions and extent of these traces of the geological deluge, which were known by the late 1830s quite astonishingly large-scale phenomenon. Of course, what happened then, some of you may know, next slide, I think it's the last one, um, was that it was overtaken by the, it was re, everything was reinterpreted uh, as the signs of a, an ice age. And this is a map of the, going back to the Rhone Valley, uh, a map that was produced showing what I call a mega, the, a, a mega glacier, which had extended far beyond the tiny little glaciers that still exist in the Alps, uh, filling the entire upper Rhone Valley across the site of what's now the Lake of Geneva, spreading out and pushing right up onto the Jura Hills, which are in that arc at the top. An enormous phenomenon. It's reinterpreted so that the geological deluge suddenly became, you know, suddenly, within a few years, became reinterpreted as uh, the, an ice age. But this was not, I suggest, uh, a case of religion retreating in the face of science. What happened simply was the very characteristic thing of sci the sciences being corrigible in the light of new evidence. And all that happened was that there was a uh, gradually better differentiation between the, the kind, of the, 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 the strange geological deluge, which was then trans transformed into the Ice Age on the one hand, and turned out that the that, the, that any, whatever Noah, the Noah's Flood story referred to must be a much more recent event and specifically a much more 
limited one. So I've got to get going quickly. Um, so this left the, this reinterpretation of the, of the geological deluge as biblical, as, an, as separate from the biblical flood, left the flood issue as a more recent and local, probably Mesopotamian event, because that's because that's this in the early 19th century. They thought that um, uh, that the Mesopotamia was probably the uh, where Eden might have been uh, was the uh, birth area of the human species uh, in some way or another. But I want to sort of emphasize that this same period where geology was developing as an immensely successful new science was also equally the period when scholarly biblical criticism was developing, particularly in the German universities, where the Bible was being treated as part of antiquity. And this was not always in the interests of debunking the religious uh, meaning of the, of, of the Bible, but was often as, as often, I think, as, uh, in the service of a search for the original meaning. So at the roots of this uh, supposed conflict, or it is a, it's a conflict enough, but, it, it, but, but I think we need to think of it with a, with a social dimension, uh, because it was between, very often between the educated and the uneducated. At the roots of it, of course, is the issue of literalism. And this is as true of the 19th century uh, battle between the scientific geologists, many of them uh, religious people, versus the scriptural geologists, so-called, miscalled geologists. And there's a similar similarity between that and the 21st century conflicts between scientific geology and, and creationist fundamentalism. So the problem, I think, is fundamentalism of all kinds, including, of course, the atheistic kind um, peddled by people like Dawkins. Now, so, uh, I think I'm going to have to, 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 to stop at that point because uh, there's more I could say, but I think there's a little, little, little time for questions and comments that you may have on what I've said. That is obviously a great deal more scholarly things you could say which uh, are available in the university library, I know. Also in heifers. Very, in heifers. <laughs> very good value, yeah. I have to have my say. Yeah. Yeah. The sequel just about to go to press. So. Excellent. Well, uh, as many of you know, we want to finish at 2 o'clock sharp because people have other things to do, but that gives us lots of time for questions. Um, so, does anybody want to kick off with any comments or questions about what we've heard today? Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the deluge um, has been sort of documented in the literature of other cultures. Yes. So I was wondering if you could sort of comment briefly on sort of what types of literature, for example, is it sort of like narrative accounts, scientific accounts? Yes, I'm trying, I mean, the, the locations. That it's yes, I mean the, the Chinese um, accounts. But you see, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a sinologist, and I have no idea what the modern, current interpretation of these bits of literature are. What I do know is that they were known to somebody like my one of my heroes is uh, Georges Cuvier, for example, who first integrated these stories with with um, with his scientific evidence for, for extinction. Um, that he took them. He, he interpreted them in a pretty good, hard-nosed way. Uh, in other words, he, he said, look, these, these stories look as though they've probably got a core of genuine historicity to them. But they are overlaid with all sorts of um, uh, legendary um, characteristics because they, they, were, they, were, uh, they were composed in the context of of rulers who wanted to aggrandize themselves and their claims and so on, show that uh, they, were, you know, they went back to the uh, dot and so on. So, I mean, I've no idea what modern Chinese scholars, sinologists, think about these stories, what status they have. All I know is that uh, 200 years ago, they were, be they were be beginning to be uh, explored by West, by Western, by European scholars, and were taken to be possibly uh, genuine historical records, however garbled, they might nevertheless have a core of historicity, uh, and which did suggest that there had been some 
a, you know, major exceptional watery catastrophe way back in the very dimmest, earliest uh, kind of human history. So he, he so Hume and many others sort of equated <coughs> these potentially tentatively with, well, this might have been the same sort of event that uh, that, um, that that generated the, the story of Noah's flood. So it was only a bit later, a generation later, that they realised, no, these these um, stories, however genuine they may be, date from much, much too recently by geological standards to be an explanation of, for example, this, all this diluvial stuff that these... Uh, is, is there that sort of evidence in places like China, you know, the well, diluvial... Well, uh, whether there's any physical evidence, I don't know. That was never talked about. It was This was purely textual. So they, I mean, they were these, these uh, Chinese scholars of the Chinese documents in the early 19th century were doing on those documents what other scholars, their, very often their colleagues, were doing on the biblical documents. In other words, doing some, some really careful textual analysis and, and working out you know, what the original form of the story might have been, what the original meaning of the words might have been, so that you, you know, were interpreting it correctly in terms of the period in which the documents had first been produced. That was the, the intention. There's a book, The Bible as History, which is now very old, by Bernard Keller, which describes the Babylonian myths, uh, which are preserved on the original cuneiform clay tablets and so on, and also describes going down through 3.7 metres of water-laid clay, which gives the idea that living in uh, the Tigris and Euphrates valleys, they knew about catastrophic floods and were creating those myths around real historical events that people had experienced. Mm -hmm. And those, the, the authors, relate to the biblical flood stories, which were around and get reinterpreted within the uh, context of ancient Israel, mm -hmm. saying, this is our God. Um, but there's books on it, yes. Yes. Uh, you, you described a myth, the myth of the scientists versus the yes. religion. Being a story held for a purpose, yes. and I wondered if you'd speculated as to why these people continue to propagate this myth today. Well, they want to undermine religious belief. I think it's putting it very simply and bluntly. Uh, I think it's as simple as that. So, any any anything that any weapon that can be used to to show how irrational uh, the foundations of religious belief are are all grist of their mill. And, and the, on the other side. Well, the other side, people wanting to, to, to claim that uh, religious belief is still, you know, possible, legitimate, and defensible in the modern world. I mean, I, I don't know whether that answers the, the kind of answer that you wanted, but I mean, that's what it seems to me. It seems to me that, that uh, but I mean, if you, you, I don't want to sort of make a, a thing out of, out of Dawkins. I don't think he deserves it, but I mean, if you look at his latest book on the God Delusion, or whatever it's called, and you see the incredible uh, ignorance of a man about anything to do with religion. I mean, it's appalling that he pontificates about, and, but, you know, he uses his genuine and well-earned authority as a scientist for a totally uh, improper purpose. And, and it seems to me that it's exactly parallel to, to, to what the, the um, religious pub fundamentalists uh, are doing in exactly the same way, the same combination of extraordinary arrogance, do dogmatism, and sheer ignorance of, of what it is that they're proposing to, 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 to campaign against. I think we'll take another question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, you commented that at the late 18th century there was a sense of deep time. Yes. It was qual uh, qualitative rather yes. than quantitative, yes. but I seem to remember people like Buffon were sort of coming up with various numbers. And I wondered, and I seem to remember somebody thousand with one of them, and he changed his mind a few times. So I wondered where they got those numbers from. What well, he got, sort of he got his, read my book, read the book. Right. <laughs> a whole <laughs> section on, on, on Buffon's time scale. Right. And the short yeah. answer is he got it from, from his physics, as he understood it, because he had thought on other grounds that the Earth was a cooling body. And he did ex some very brilliant experiments on model globes, heating them in a, in a furnace to, 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 to white heat. And then uh, different, made of different materials, different different diameters, and so on, uh, and measuring uh, how quickly they they cool down. 
And then he did this very bold extrapolation from a few inches up to a few thousand, several, many thousands of miles diameter, um, and said, you know, and so he did a calculation. But I think the crucial thing about that is that it was, uh, he, he, he actually thought behind the scenes, as it were, uh, that his, his estimates were probably underestimates. But he didn't, he didn't keep them secret for, you know, for fear of religiously orthodox, because even the ones that he did publish uh, you know, were far greater than they, far longer than the, than, the short, than the traditional short time scale that you got in, say, something like Burnett, a few thousand years. So, I mean, he got it out of physics, but I mean, you know, by that time, it, was, it doesn't seem to me, actually, it seems to make much difference whether you're thinking in terms of deep time of, of tens of thousands of years, or tens of millions, or, or, or even a few billions of years. That doesn't actually operationally make much difference. At that level of science that they were doing then, obviously, as time goes on, it becomes more and more important just, you know, just how many zeros you've got on the end of the, of the, of the time scale. Yes, yes. Given the amount of uh, abuse reserved by the fundamentalists for Christians who are also scientists, I think that the explanation that these people merely wish to establish religious belief is not really very adequate. I, th I think it's time that people really studied what the motives behind the fundamentalist movement actually are as some, and actually look into the psychology of it. It's not really to, uh, to s support the cause of religion. Well, I agree with that. I mean, and, and, uh, I would only say that I think to say the psychology, that's, that's only part of it. And I think much more importantly, we need to examine, as some people have done in a scholarly way in, on the American scene, to, we need to examine the socio-political context of it. And, and you know, because it is very specific social, social groups who are putting forward this kind of thing. And it's clear that they're, you know, that I don't want to get into this because it's too, too big and too big a, a topic. But, but I agree with you that uh, I mean, what, I, what I said as answer to this lady here was, was a sort of you know, first approximation, a kind of very, very rough uh, response. But I agree it's an, ad, an inadequate one. I wanted to ask if you could expand a little bit on the historiography of it. I mentioned Andrew Dixon. Yes. Was he one of the first people? start writing the history of geology in these terms? No, no, it goes, it actually goes back to the period I've been talking about in the, uh, in the sort of early 19th century. But, uh, you know, it becomes generalized in, say, somebody like Dixon or Andrew Dixon White, uh, in, 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 in a sort of, you know, a kind of mega narrative, as it were, this is, this is what's been happening all along, and you bring in uh, Galileo and bring in Darwin and you can bring in the sort of geology versus genesis of the early 19th century and so on. This is all part of a long-term campaign to how there's been a, you know, a, a perennial and endemic conflict between science with a capital S, which I think is a, is a nonsense anyway, and religion with a capital S, which is an equal nonsense because there's <laughs> such diversity on both sides. It does, you know, does, does no good to uh, to, to reify the two things in, in that way. I think we have time for just one last question. Sorry. You, you mentioned the, 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 the dangers of the, the capital S and the capital R. Yeah. Um, but certainly people in the 19th century seem to be sort of caught within that, uh, even quite intelligent people. Because uh, in uh, A.M. Wilson's um, book, um, God's Funeral, about 19th century doubt, he has a, a letter from Tennyson to Hasler saying, I can cope, my evangelical faith has been frayed, basically, but I can't cope with, I can cope with some things, but I can't cope with the, the noise of the geologist's hammers. That's what's ruined my faith, he said. And apparently also Lyle was very careful back in 1835. He was very anxious not to publish his book because of all these sorts of, the whole sort of religious thing was going to be raised by it. I think that last thing is, is as much a part of a myth, to oh, be honest, okay. as the very similar myth to the effect that, that Charles Darwin was scared stiff of publishing his oh, Origin of Species right. okay. for reasons of, of I mean, it, you look at what was going on in the, in the early to mid 19th century, even in this country, which I say is a very peculiar exception to the, 
rest of the intellectual world. Um, I just, I just don't see that that kind of argument has any, 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 any plausibility at all, because they weren't going to get, uh, you know, clobbered or uh, uh, persecuted in any way for doing this sort of thing. There was such a wide range of um, uh, opinions were were acceptable and were often, you know, you have tremendous arguments in, in print and they didn't pull their punches about these things. Uh, but it's very different from saying you, you're going to be, be, be thrown into jail or put into the stocks or something like that. Well, thank you very much. This is a very good point for me, actually as a geologist, to remind you that the first thing you learn on the first lecture in geology is that the present is the key to the past. And I think this is a, a splendid example of how the past can be the key to the present, uh, because how these issues have been dealt with in the past, I think, is a live issue for how we should deal with them today. So thank you very much again.